It is a pleasure to welcome you to worship on this Lord's Day. Yet again, we have had snow and uh, sleet and ice on a Saturday night into Sunday morning. But I thank you for braving the elements to get here today. It is the first Sunday in Lent. People of the covenant, give thanks. Children of the living God, draw near. Let us worship God. Our hymn is number 165. Unite our hearts in the prayer for this Lord's Day. Loving God, you have made covenant with us and with every living creature. We give thanks for the sign of the rainbow, for it reminds you and us of your promise that the flood of destruction will not be the last word. We thank you too for the waters of baptism, the sign that we are raised as children of the covenant through Jesus Christ our Lord. And we thank you for the sign of the dove, the promise of your Holy Spirit, hovering over the dawn of creation, descending upon your beloved Son. Your Spirit also hovers over and descends upon us. With the whole creation, we give you all glory and honor. In your triune name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. We have a responsive prayer of confession. And as we join in this, emphasize especially the silent time of prayer. Speak to your Heavenly Father who gladly receives you into His everlasting and always loving arms. Lord, I have betrayed you by following my own way. And I have mocked you by not taking your death seriously. Live in me and with me day by day, that together we may make a world that is new. Let us take a time of silent prayer. The mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. And so I declare to you the good news of the Gospel of Jesus Christ. In Jesus Christ, we are always forgiven. Let us stand and give God the glory. Amen. 
Please stand. The peace of Christ fill your hearts and lives. Oh, go ahead and hug up, risk it. <laughs> for reinforcements. No? Okay. Have a Pez? Have a Pez? We passed the piece, now we pass the Pez. Sort of did something weird there. Hmm. They're just, there it is. No, they just didn't want to come out because they know it's cold. <laughs> and Michaela, you want one? Certainly. Certainly. Children, good morning. Wow, I'm so glad to see you all here at church. It's pretty neat to see you here. I have a question for you. You think God has favorite numbers? Now, don't you guys get any ideas out of this about, you know. Do you think God has favorite numbers? No? Well, why not? That, that, that's some good theology. God created us. God, God created all things. God created all numbers. So God must cherish all numbers. I didn't think of that. Hmm. Thank you for the children's sermon. <laughs> I was operating under the idea that maybe God does have some favorite numbers. For example, the number three, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That shows up a lot because God has triune. Um, God has uh, Ten Commandments. We're going to learn about that in confirmation class. Seems to be very fond of that ten number. Hmm. And seven. It's a holy number, supposedly, but how many days are there in a week? Seven. I wonder if God has favorite numbers. But I'm sure God loves all things that God created. One of the numbers that we see often showing up in Scripture is the number 40. I wonder if that might have been God's jersey, playing some football, maybe. Oh, you're 42? Well, I don't have anything on that one, but 40. For example, do you know how long Israel wandered in the desert before it came to the Promised Land after it escaped from, from Egypt? How many years? 40. Do you know... Okay. After Jesus was baptized, he went out into the desert and he faced temptation from the devil and wild beasts and was ministered to by angels. How many days was that? Forty. You guys catch on quick. And, you know, we're in a season of the church here. It started last Wednesday with Ash Wednesday. And this special season, we wear purple, okay? And it's called Lent. And as you sang that last hymn, it's a time when we remember to be especially attentive to things like prayer and fasting and remembering Jesus and his sacrifice for us on a cross and how he loved us and sacrificed for us. And can you guess how long... Lent is how many days? Forty. So you see, there's something to this forty thing. We have forty days in Lent, 
until we get to Easter, we have 40 days for a special time of, of reflection, of thinking about Jesus and of opening our hearts and praying to Jesus. We have a special time. Now I have a question. How many of you go to school? What grade are you in? Third grade, what grade are you in? Six, what grade are you in? Six, what grade are you in? Seventh, what grade? First, what grade? Fifth, fourth. Do your teachers ever give you homework? Sometimes? Plenty? Okay. Hasn't changed any from back in the dark ages. Do they ever give you written assignments or something that you have to do not immediately, but maybe the next day? Sort of. Do they ever give you assignments kind of where you have to do it, but come back in a week when it's done? Yeah? Like, like what would that be? You ever have to like read a book and give a report? A really long project. I like that. You see, Lent is kind of like a really long project because it's 40 days long. And it's a project that we need to work on every day to take time and pray and remember Jesus and what He did for us and say, wow, thank you, Jesus. That's your homework assignment. Gee whiz, children's church, children's sermons have homework assignments. <coughs> Would you during Lent take the next 35 days and remember to take some time in your day to pray, to remember Jesus, and to say thank you? Let's start right now. Every head bowed and your eyes closed and your hands folded. Oh, loving God, thank you for a special time to, to remember Jesus and all He did for us, teaching and healing and leading and instructing and loving, even dying for us, that we may live. Perhaps the best prayer that we can say as we think about all this that, that Jesus does for us is simply saying, Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. In His name we pray. Amen. Well, we're going to sing a hymn now, and you can go to, to children's Sunday school or return to your families. And our hymn is number 157.
The congregation may be seated. It is our pleasure to welcome new members into the life of our congregation. Would Kathy and Sophie and Chris and Rick and Rebecca and Ron please come forward. We'll just form a little line here. Right over. Stand next to Chris. Keep an eye on him, you know. <laughs> well, I want to introduce some of these folks. Sophie, you're a sophomore, double major, musical theater and speech language pathology. Boy, am I glad you're here. <laughs> and Chris is a junior. He's an ROTC student. He's in criminal justice and sociology. Kathy grew up in the life of this church, and we are delighted to welcome her back into the life of the church after moving here and there. And she works in the pharmaceutical industry. Okay, let me think here. Okay, Rick. Rick is from Pittsburgh. Important to remember. Where's Coach? Okay, Pittsburgh. Okay. And uh, Rick is a business teacher at South. Rebecca is uh, working at Lehigh Valley Hospital and she is in the mental health field uh, working with folks and just finished up becoming a massage therapist. Ron is a EMT and paramedic and he's at Marywood pursuing a PA, a physician assistantship. Wow, probably pretty good for my age to remember all this stuff. <laughs> my friends, hear the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit. Everyone who acknowledges me before people, I will also acknowledge before my Father, who is in heaven. My friends, God has chosen you, and in baptism has joined you to himself, He's called you together with us into the church, which is his body. And he's brought you now to this time and this place, so that you may confess his name and go out and serve him as faithful disciples. Who is your Lord and Savior? Do you trust in him? If so, say, I do. Do you intend to be his disciple, to obey his word and show his love? If so, say, I do. Will you be a faithful member of this congregation, giving of yourself in every way? And will you seek the fellowship of the church wherever you may be? If so, say, I will. Amen. My dear ones, you are disciples of Jesus Christ. He's commissioned you. Live in his love. Serve him. Let us pray. O oh God, our Father, we praise you for calling us to be a servant people and for gathering us into the body of Christ. We thank you for choosing to add to our number brothers and sisters in faith. Together may we live in your spirit and so love one another that we may have the mind of Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom we give honor and glory forever. Amen. Welcome to this ministry of Jesus Christ. Go now and serve the Lord and the blessing of God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be upon and abide with you forevermore. Amen. Please join me in welcoming them. Now don't forget to mob them after worship in Coffee Fellowship and ask them all about their lives and share your lives with them. It's exciting to welcome them. Good morning. Our reading today comes, our Old Testament reading today comes from Genesis chapter 9, verses 8 through 17, found on page 7 in your Pew Bible. Then God said to Noah and to his sons with him, 
As for me, I am establishing my covenant with you and your descendants after you. And with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the domestic animals, and every animal on earth with you, as many as came out of the ark. I establish my covenant with you, that never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of a flood, and never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. God said, This is the sign of the covenant that I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for all future generations. I have set my bow in the clouds, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. When I bring clouds over the earth and when the bow the bow is seen in the clouds, I will remember my covenant that is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh, and the waters shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. When the bow is in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. God said to Noah, This is the sign of the covenant that I have established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. Our epistle lesson today comes from 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 18 through 22, found on page 234 of your pew Bible. For Christ also suffered for the sins once for all, the righteousness for the unrighteous, in order to bring you to God. He was put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which also he went and made a proclamation to the spirits in prison, who in former times did not obey, when God waited patiently in the days of Noah during the building of the ark, in which a few, that is, eight persons, were saved through water. And baptism, which this prefigured, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for good conscience through the resurrection of Christ Jesus, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers made subject to him. Here ends our reading. May God bless this holy word. Listen also to the gospel for this Lord's Day and the gospel according to St. Mark, the first chapter reading verses 9 through 15. In those days Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the Spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, the Beloved. With you I am well pleased. And the Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. He was in the wilderness forty days, tempted by Satan, and he was with the wild beasts, and the angels waited on him. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. Here ends the scripture. May it be a blessing to all of our hearts. Amen.
I couldn't think of a better beginning for this homily than you singing Amazing Grace. Grace to you and peace from God our Heavenly Father and His Son Jesus Christ our blessed Lord. Last Sunday was Transfiguration Sunday and as we read that gospel we heard the voice of God in the occasion of Transfiguration when God says this is my beloved Son listen to him. It's interesting now that we go to the first Sunday of Lent and we move from Transfiguration and a turning point where he starts to turn towards his suffering and his final ministry going to Jerusalem, they take us back on this first Sunday of Lent, back to the beginning in the Gospel of Mark, back to the story of Jesus' baptism. The people who are Greek scholars, which I most certainly am not, are fond of pointing out in this first chapter of Mark that there is a perfect liturgical uh, Greek form and style similarity between verse 5 and the verse that we began with today. In verse 5 it speaks of the two central geographic locations of Jerusalem where the temple of the Lord was and Judea which was the prominent uh, area of the history of Israel. Judea was the, was the first among the counties, as it were. And scores of people coming out with religious devotion and with hunger to go and be baptized by John. They sketch that out for you. Verse 5. But in the Gospel that I read for you, it is contrasted that in this portion of the Gospel, we have the geo geography that's noted as Nazareth and Galilee. Not a center stone of, of religious devotion. Not a place of rich history. Not a, not a central focus of Israel. But rather Nazareth, a town that's not even mentioned in Scripture in the Old Testament. Nazareth, just a place that's understood as as so casual, you have to check them out to see if there's any religious devotion at all. And Galilee, a place of lawlessness. Kind of like the wild, wild west of Israel. Startlingly different. And instead of many coming out to see John, just one coming out to be baptized by John. Jesus. In contrast to those who have religious ardor, for those who have a sense of desperation and need spiritually, in the fifth verse, Jesus comes out, as it were, alone from a, a lawless and apathetic place to stand alone before John and be baptized. And this is the point. In contrast to Judea, in contrast to Jerusalem, Jesus comes on behalf of all the mediocre people. Of all the sinful people. Of all the lawless people. Of all the people who are lost and don't even know they're lost. Jesus comes to John to be baptized on their behalf. Wow! Do you get it? Jesus comes for us who are so often dazed and confused as we seek to live our lives. Jesus comes and submits to John's baptism. Now remember the Gospel of Mark is the dragnet gospel. You know I say that a lot, right? Just the facts. No embellishment. No great detail. Just the facts. When Jesus is baptized as He comes up out of the water, the heavens are rent asunder and the voice of God comes down and the Holy Spirit as a dove hovers over Jesus. Jesus comes up. God the Father and the Spirit comes down. It's reminiscent of the, the prophets in the Old Testament who prophesied and prayed, O oh Lord, that You would rip the heavens asunder and come down. In this moment, in this point, this, this determinant of Jesus' life, it happens. He comes up 
The Spirit comes down. The Father says, this is my beloved Son with whom I'm well pleased. As we go into Lent, I'd like to suggest that this passage gives us some magnificent opportunity for some self-reflection. And I want to give you a homework assignment like I gave the kids. Take some time today and ask yourselves what have been the pivotal moments, the defining moments of my life? Where have been some of these, these moments where it comes together and a course of direction is set. It's kind of congruent with your Sunday school class. For Jesus, it's when he submits the baptism and stands with and for the broken people of humankind and comes up out of the water and receives the imprimatur, the blessing of the Father and the hovering of the Spirit. But Mark doesn't stop there. Mark says that the same Spirit who hovers on Jesus in his baptism drives him out into the wilderness. Jesus is already with John in the wilderness. That's a prophetic symbol. Jesus is claiming his prophetic responsibilities as the Messiah of God. But Jesus is driven out into the wilderness further for 40 days. The other Gospels give us great detail about the temptation of Satan, of Jesus. Mark doesn't seem to care much about it. He simply says that Jesus went out for 40 days and was tempted by Satan. He says that he faced wild animals and being a good three-point sermon, and the angels ministered unto Jesus. Why did he not get into all the, the nitty-gritty stuff that the other Gospel writers get into? Why not up on the temple or the bread thing? Why, why did he just cut to the chase and say this, this, and this? Temptation, wild animals, angels. Well, I'm glad you asked. He does it because I think he's saying that's what life is about. Now think about that for a minute. Isn't that what life is about? Don't we, each and every one, as we seek to follow the Lord, face steadfast temptation? Well, I do. How about you? Isn't that a characteristic of life? That, that when you're really living close to the Lord, you can count on Satan to come and give you a little jab in the kidneys and try to tempt you, distract you, catch you up. Move you away. In our Lenten devotion, it is important in addition to identifying those pivotal moments of your life, to be honest with yourself and say, where do I most experience temptation in my life? What is the one-two punch that Satan throws at me year in and year out? If I can identify it, perhaps I can counter Perhaps I can bob and weave a little bit. Perhaps I can duck and yield not to temptation. Second, where are the wild animals and beasts that seek to devour me in my life? Maybe it is a chronic health condition. Maybe it's an issue of employment. Maybe it's a relationship where that person drives me nuts. Maybe it's something that just feels like it's it's out to nag at me and to bite at my heels. And third in your devotion, which is actually fourth, I am counting. Where is God ministering to me? With God's ministering angels? Where do I experience those, those grace moments that kind of give me the hug that I need? And lift me up and pick me up and assure me that God's amazing grace is still very much intact in my life. I really like the Gospel of Mark. While the other Gospel writers get caught up in detail, 
Mark reminds us that Jesus was baptized on our behalf. Mark reminds us that God leads us into pivotal moments of time in our lives that are defining. God reminds us that, that or Mark reminds us that, that just as Jesus was baptized, we have been baptized in Jesus and nothing separates us from the love of Christ. Mark reminds us to watch out for temptation. What Mark reminds us to identify the wild beasts in our lives. And Mark assures us that the God who loves us in Jesus Christ never lets us go and will minister to us with moments of grace. God's ministering angels. And that's the point of the story. We have a Savior. May we follow Him. Amen. Please stand for the creed. On Communion Sundays, we use the Nicene Creed, which is on page 34 of the hymnal. Let us confess the faith of the universal church. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made, for us and for our salvation. He came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, he suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Our hymn is number 523 as we prepare for communion.
be seated. Our communion liturgy is found on page 8 of the hymnal. My friends, this is the joyful feast of the people of God. People will come from north and south and from east and west to sit at table in the kingdom of God. According to Luke, when our risen Lord was at table with his disciples, he took the bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. Their eyes were opened and they recognized him. This is the Lord's table, and our Savior invites those who trust him to share in the feast that he has prepared. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Loving and gracious God, we give you thanks for your work in creation and that you declared all made is good. We thank you for your guiding hand of providence and that you are a faithful covenant partner giving to us your assurance of salvation in Christ. Today as we have recalled the baptism of our Lord, we remember that you fulfilled the promises to the prophets and that the heavens have been ripped asunder and that you are one with your people in Jesus. As we go through this season of Lent, Lord God of hosts, make it a holy time, a time for spiritual pause and reflection, a time for spiritual reinvigoration and refreshment. With the heavenly choirs and the faithful of every time and place, we join and say together, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Gracious and loving God, we give you thanks for Jesus, who was incarnate, totally human, and totally divine. We thank you for his holy life and ministry, that he lived among us and showed us your way. We remember his suffering and his death. But death did not defeat him. He was resurrected and lives eternally with you. We look forward to the coming reign of the Christ. For truly, he said, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And as we gather around this table of his love, we remember that he instituted it, calls us to it, and instructs us to remember him. We give you thanks that the Lord Jesus on the night before he died took bread and after giving thanks to you he broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, Take, eat, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way Jesus took the cup saying, This cup is the new covenant sealed in my blood shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. Great is the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Gracious God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these, your gifts of bread and wine, that the bread that we break and the cup we bless may be the communion of the body and blood of Christ. Through Christ, with Christ, in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor are yours Almighty God, now and forever, and let us say one time, Amen. And now as our Lord has taught us, please join in the Lord's Prayer that's printed in the hymnal. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil for the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Would the elders serving please come forward?
serve God's people. This is the body of Christ given for you. Take, eat. Serve God's people.
The blood of Christ shed for you. Take, drink. Let us pray. Gracious God, we give you thanks for this holy communion shared in your love, for your spirit in our lives that strengthens and encourages us, for your grace made known in Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, in whose name we pray. Amen. Elders, you may be seated. Let us bring our tithes and our offerings to the Lord. Let us pray. Loving God, how good it is to stand before You and say thank You for Your many blessings in our lives. Continue to bless us, we pray, that we may in turn be a blessing to others, showing forth the love of Christ in thought and word and deed. Hear our prayers as we remember Linda and Buder and Betty, Marie and Arlene and Lois, Laura, those facing war in the various places throughout the world, Sherry, the Rinker family, Tim and Rebecca and David, Rich and Michael and Paul, Van Tingley, Carolyn, Anita, and Todd, for those who experience heartfelt grief, we pray that you would lift them up and encourage them and give them peace that passes understanding. For those facing various physical affliction, O oh Lord our God, extend to them your healing touch. For those walking through the valley of the shadow of death, remind them that you walk behind and in front, and surround them with your grace and the reality and promise of eternal life in Jesus. We pray for 
health for our congregation. And we pray for health for ESU. We pray for peace of soul and mind and peace of diplomatic accord. We pray for justice in a world that's so full of injustice. Lord, give us your light, give us your salvation, and make us a beacon by your grace for the kingdom of heaven. Bless us with a holy Lent. We pray in the name above all names, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our hymn is the old favorite, O Love That Will Not Let Me Go, number 833.